For America, 1942 is the first full, terrible year of the Second World War. Americans will feel deep concern and dedication as they turn their full energies toward one goal, the defeat of the Axis powers. It will be a challenging task, some feel next to impossible. The Nazis rule nearly all of Europe with unprecedented cruelty. In Asia, Japan is spreading its deadly tentacles into country after country. And so we fight with small but significant victories to cheer us on. We deal important blows to Japan in the battles of the Coral Sea and Midway, and the Allies invade North Africa and begin the slow push that will eventually drive the Nazis out of Europe and into oblivion. And unknown to all but a select few, a sustained chain reaction and a converted squash court at the University of Chicago will usher in the nuclear age. This and much more is the year 1942. Let's watch. Goodbye, Mama, I'm off to Yokohama for the red, white, and blue, my country and you. Goodbye, Mama, I'm off to Yokohama just to teach all those Japs, the Yanksano Saps. A million fighting sons of Uncle Sam, if you please. We'll soon have all those Japs right down on their Japanese. So goodbye, Mama. I'm off to Yokohama for my country, my flag, and you. Say goodbye to Mama. You're off to Yokohama, so be brave and be strong. You won't be gone long. Say bye-bye, Mama, the land of Yamayama, until April, I guess, will be your address. Hollywood's most famous movie stars leave the film capital to help the government sell war bonds. Irene Dunn, Ronald Coleman, Hedy Lamarr, Greer Garson, all part of a contingent of some 50 screen celebrities giving their time and talents to aid the national war effort. The country has asked the people to invest a billion dollars in one month to help pay for the war. And here's the start of the drive. Boarding a special train for Washington, they'll tour 300 cities from coast to coast. Go to any city that agrees to subscribe at least $1 million. Yes, in democratic America, everybody is doing his bit. There goes Jimmy Stewart on his way to enlist. One of the most popular stars on the screen. Joining the Air Force as a private, Jimmy has now won promotion. Today, he's Lieutenant Stewart, USA. That husky young Negro, en route to an Army induction center, is the heavyweight boxing champion of the world, Joe Lewis, the boy who beat Max Schmeling. The Army can use that fighting spirit, and Joe Lewis is now a corporal of cavalry, somewhere in the West. Moviegoers of years ago will remember Jackie Coogan. Charlie Chaplin made him famous as the kid. Well, Jackie's in the Air Force now, a staff sergeant and qualified glider pilot. A movie star of modern times is sworn into service. Tyrone Power, hero of many a daring exploit on the silver screens of the world. He'll now play his greatest role as a Leatherneck Marine. Somewhere in Egypt, President Roosevelt's eldest son, James, sees war as a major of Marines. Today, that experience stands him in good stead. For communiques report, Major James Roosevelt is with the Marines battling in the South Pacific. Franklin Roosevelt Jr. is in uniform. His fellow officer is Douglas Fairbanks Jr., a lieutenant in the Navy. Young Doug, like his famous father, every inch a man, is serving with the fleet. Clark Gable, at 41, renounces his throne as America's most popular film star to join the United States Army Air Force. Enlisting as a private, 
his ambition to become a crack aerial gunner in the crew of a bomber. Yes, movie stars arriving in Washington to help sell war bonds are all working for the same cause. The parade down Pennsylvania Avenue is a pageant of patriotism. Bing Crosby in a scout car. Jimmy Cagney. Abbott and Costello, popular comedians of stage, screen, and radio. They all assemble on the Treasury steps to launch the drive for funds. Greer Garson, Jimmy Cagney, Ann Rutherford, Irene Dunn, Hedy Lamar. And how that crowd lines up to buy bonds from their favorites. They buy knowing that every dollar invested helps send more planes, tanks, and ships to the United Nations. This is the people's way of saying, from the home front to the battlefront, from movie stars to sales clerks, America's 130 million citizens are in the war. Training motorcycle dispatch riders for the U.S. Army, one of the toughest, most grueling courses in the service. After six weeks of basic instruction, they send them on cross-country trips like this. terrific test for men and machines, they take the bumps in high gear. Now they're real veterans of the saddle. Seventy tons of airplane. The U.S. Navy's new two and one-half million dollar experimental flying boat, Mars, now ready for her maiden flight. Capable of flying the Atlantic and back without stopping for fuel, the mighty Mars is a forerunner of things to come. contrast between a Navy patrol bomber and the giant amphibian is striking. Four monster motors, each with more power than a locomotive. Armed to the teeth, planes like the Mars can speed men and weapons to the battlefronts of the world in a matter of hours. Tennis fans the world over hail Donald Budge and Bobby Riggs as two of the greatest exponents of the game. At Long Island's famous Forest Hills, the Wimbledon of America, they meet for the National Professional Championship. Budge serving, 26 years old, Don holds more titles than any man in tennis, and he's winning again. Europe remembers the Yankee redhead for his brilliant performances with the Davis Cup team. Riggs serving, and today he's no match for the champion. Budge now serving in the far court, and this time Riggs wins a point. But Budge has two sets, and he's taking the title with three in a row. Undisputed master of the courts. Listen, gents. I've been pushing a hack around New York for quite a couple of years, namely 22. It is my personal experience that there is more automobiles in Set City than there is people. How would you like to have to navigate through this mob in order to make a nice couple of dollars? Well, I was going to retire and take up a new line of business until certain Japanazis decided to clop us on the chops. First result is I don't have to retire because this here war is made from traffic a dead macro. Right away, mobs decide they can put away the Buicks and use the feet. And I'm telling you, getting dead stories face is worse than getting into the World Series. This, of course, has now eliminated the Sunday drivers, the characters who make right turns from the left and left turns from the right, and various other citizens, mostly of the opposite sex, who should never have been allowed to drive in the first place if I had anything to say about it. The way it is now, a person who wants to go from Greenpoint to Harlem has got to use the subways. So everybody is very happy with the possible exception of the street claim department because a lot of people from Brooklyn had forces hidden under rocks from which they now have come out of retirement. 
Now I got something else in my mind. This is the old village after dark with the masses lighting up the double cross roads of the world, the main stem, the hardened artery. You're right, brother, good old Broadway. It was a kind of a pretty sight with the neons twinkling like little stars in sections like Flatbush and even Staten Island. Well, this here practice is now a memory. We got ourselves a dim on account of the way the ships stand out against our lights. So, come six o'clock, Fifth Avenue looks like it was in Hackensack, and I wouldn't have believed it. I also wouldn't have believed it if you said you couldn't go to Louis the Grocer and buy all the tomato and pea soup you wanted, like, for instance, this doll is doing in the good old days before this war, on which you gents is an expert. A lot of you also had to have the Mazuma to pay for that heart attack. But that's not the problem now. You can have a zillion bucks, but the way it is now, you gotta be a certified public accountant to buy a can of pork and beans. This improvement is what is known as rationing, which I will now explain to you. First, you gotta add up what you got, like these ladies are doing. Then if what you got ain't enough, you start to make a list of what it takes to feed the relatives, the kids, and maybe a couple of old cousins thrown in. After you do this, you go and you stand online to get a book, without which the grocery will positively give you a fish eye. But here comes the real pain in the neck, trying to juggle the points so that everything comes out. This makes filling out income taxes strictly for amateurs. And there are lots of people who now wish they hadn't played hooky when a teacher was given out with addition and subtraction. Because if you don't figure right, you have nothing to chew on but fresh vegetables, which is hay strictly for citizens that chew their cuds, or maybe rabbits. But even me and all the other characters in Manhattan ain't those. And this goes for all the citizens in the suburbs, which reaches to the Los Angeles County line. We know where the gas is going and the electric light bulbs and the ketchup. You're getting it, gents, and that's okay with us. Eat hearty, bub, and bring the pennant back to the guys who are sitting in the bleachers yelling for a home run. Mail call from the United States of America. Stand by, Americans. Stand by, servicemen of the United Nations. Here's mail call, selected by fighting men as one of the three top radio programs presented regularly by Armed Forces Radio. And tonight, special greetings to you servicemen from the state of California. Ready to speed this sunny salute on its way is an adopted sweater girl of the Bear State. She's all wool and a sarong wide, Miss Dorothy Lamour. And now, fellas, get set for two of America's favorites, Abbott and Costello. <laughs> I understand, I understand that all the boys that's over there, they're, they're going to have a big baseball team, and I understand you're going to be the manager. That's right. Yeah? Yeah, how Well, if you're going to be the manager of the baseball team, I would like to join myself. That's all right. I would like to know some of the guys' names on the team, so when I meet them on the street or in the ballpark, I'll be able to say hello to them. Well, naturally, I'll introduce you to the boys, and a regular bunch of boys we've got. But you know, strange as it may seem, they give these ball players very peculiar names. Yeah, funny names. Strange names, like... Um, Dizzy Dean and Daffy, Daffy Dean. I'm their cousin. Who are you? Goofy. 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 <laughs> well, let's see. We have uh, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find and, out. And then we... I say, who's on first, uh, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. Yeah, you know the fellow's name? Yes. Well, who's on first? Yes. I mean the fellow's name? Yes. I mean the guy playing first. Who? The fellow playing first. Who? The first baseman. Who? The guy playing first. Who is on first? Well, what are you asking me for? <laughs> I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. Who is on first? I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. Well, go ahead and tell me. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy on first base. Who? The fellow playing first. Look, who is on first? Have you got a first baseman? Yes. Who's playing there? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm trying to find out is what's the guy's name on first base? No, wait a minute. No, wait a minute. Don't mix them up. What is on second? Who's on second? No, who is on first? I don't know. He's on third now. We're not talking about him. How did I get on third base? You just mentioned his name. If I mentioned the third baseman's name, who did I say is playing third? No, who's playing first? Never mind first. I don't know. What's the guy's name on third base? What's on second? Who's on second? Who's on first? I don't know. Third base. <laughs> and you got a third baseman? Certainly. Then who's playing third? Who is playing first? What's playing first? No, what's on second? I don't know. He's third base. Third base. <laughs> You got an outfield? Well, surely. Tell a fielder's name. Why? 
I don't know. I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> I just thought I'd tell you. So tell me who's playing left field. No, who's playing first? What's playing first? What's on second? I don't know. Third, Third base. base, yes. <laughs> Have you got a catcher? Well, naturally. The catcher's name. Today. Today. And tomorrow's pitch. Now you've got it. That's all. We've got a couple of days on the team. Well, I can't help that. But I used to be a catcher, too. I'll get behind the plate, do some fancy catching. Yes. Tomorrow's pitching on my team, and the heavy hitter gets up, yeah. Joseph Valentine, the heavy hitter. Now, Valentine gets up, and he bunts the ball. Mm -hmm. Now, when he bunts the ball, me being a good catcher, I'm going to throw Valentine out of first base, so I pick up the ball and throw it to who? Now, that's the first thing you said right. I don't even know what I'm talking about! <laughs> that's all you have to do. All I know is I throw the ball to first base. Now, whoever it is drops the ball, so Valentine runs a second. Yes. Now, I pick up the ball, and I throw it to who? Whoever it is drops the ball, he throws it to what? What throws it? I don't know. I don't know if it throws it back to tomorrow. That's triple play. That's right. <laughs> Another guy gets up and it's a long fly ball to be caught. Why? I don't know. He's on third and I don't give a damn. <laughs> I, I don't give a damn. Oh, that's a short stop. <laughs> mightiest bomber plant is rolling. Henry Ford welcomes British and U.S. war supply heads Oliver Littleton and Donald Nelson. The schedule, one bomber every hour. Second stop on their tour of inspection is the assembly line of a huge tank plant. Six months ago, sleek, shiny automobiles were rolling through the grounds. Today, grim, heavy weapons of war are being readied for service at the front. On the Pacific Coast, workers in a bomber plant get a visit from America's hero of the hour, General James Doolittle, the man who led the first United States bombing raid on Tokyo. Addressing the men who built the ships that rained bombs on Japan, the general said, thanks for some great airplanes. under fire. These are the first pictures of America's great naval victory in the Pacific. Army, Navy, and Marine planes, cooperating with the fleet, surprise a Jap invasion force sent to capture strategic Midway Island, stepping stone to Hawaii and the North American continent. U.S. planes roaring to the attack amid a rain of anti-aircraft fire. The toll, 18 Japanese ships. Cruisers, carriers, and destroyers, crippled like this or sent to the bottom. A blow more than equal to the defeat Japan suffered in the Battle of the Coral Sea. Back in port, Admiral Nimitz, who directed the action, bestows medals for deeds of valor. They fought the strangest naval battle in history, a battle in which the ships were hundreds of miles apart. The stories told by these hero pilots may rewrite all textbooks on naval warfare. They proved again and again that warplanes can blast battleships and transports. In one epic engagement, these men upset the balance of power in the Pacific. New York's colorful Belmont Park dedicates its greatest day of racing to the Army Navy Relief Fund. 30,000 fans including U.S. General Hugh Drum and Admiral Adolphus Andrews, head the host of servicemen here for the Big Turf Classic. The $53,000 Belmont Stakes. The nation's champion three-year-olds all the way together. nearly $2 million for the day, the crowd now sees their favorite Al Sab running second. Shut out, the Kentucky Derby winner is in front and there to stay. No matter which one wins, America's servicemen collect the profits. That's a real sporting gesture. America honors Army nurses who served under fire in the Philippines. Heroines of Manila, of Bataan and Corregidor, 
Their deeds have written an epic chapter in U.S. history. Mrs. Roosevelt looks on as six who came back receive medals for valor. To student nurses, their courage is an inspiration. Caring for the wounded until told to go, they were the last to leave. On the home front, women enlist for less glamorous, less hazardous, but equally important work in industry. Replacing men who are called to the colors, these girls are operating one of the nation's biggest lumber mills. Today, women in overalls, women in war jobs, are to be found throughout the length and breadth of America. Even at Army Proving Grounds, the so-called weaker sex is doing a man-sized job. Testing tanks is just daily routine for this all-girl crew. On the firing range, they try out the latest machine guns. A 50-millimeter aerial defense weapon with plenty of kick. Manning anti-aircraft batteries, they feed shells and fire them with clockwork precision.
moral snafu is the harder you work, the sooner we're gonna be Hitler, that joint. Guadalcanal Airport the tiny patch of land for which Japan has sacrificed a fleet of warships and thousands of fighting men still bristles with United States bombers. For the forces that control Guadalcanal command the approaches to Australia, full mastery of the skies over the vitally important Solomon Islands. Today, these land-based bombers are leading the way as the combined United States land, sea, and air offensive begins the task of sweeping the Japs from the South Pacific. Plunging into malaria-infested jungles, the Marines steadily, doggedly enlarge their hold on the island. At an advanced base, they enjoy their first rest in weeks. They have the advantage of an uninterrupted supply line, and they get nothing but the best. chances on being surprised by roving Jap patrols. Any line may be the front line on Guadalcanal, and they dig in as they advance. Machine guns always on the ready. Artillerymen back up the infantry, blasting the Japs from the island. lineup of champions to take the field since the last Olympic Games features the American Athletic Union track meet at New York City. Finish of the 110 meter dash and the winner is San Francisco's Harold Davis. In classic Greek style, America's champion heaving the 16 pound shot put nearly 60 feet. Here they go in the 110 meter high hurdles. Sports playing an important part in the physical training program for America's youth. Watch the youngster nearest the camera. A university student, he wins the title in 14 seconds. And here's the pole vaulter they all talk about. Warmer Dan, only man ever to leap higher than 15 feet. Champion of the world, par excellence. Behind the scenes in a U.S. war plant, rushing the manufacture of Army Scout cars. Here is a vivid example of how the famous American auto assembly line has been converted to speed equipment for war. American engineering genius for mass production, getting things done in a hurry. In a matter of hours, the finished cars roll off the line and are driven to ports of embarkation. Yankee soldiers call them jeeps, and the world will be seeing a lot of them. New to this war, they're the legs of America's motorized infantry. Servicemen on 24-hour leave. Sailors in port waiting to rejoin their ships. Soldiers on furlough. All find free food and a warm welcome at recreation centers in nearly every American city. Any United Nations uniform is their passport. British tars and Yankee seamen having the time of their lives. Variety stars and theatrical troops donating their time and talent to keep the boys smiling. dancing star, and none ever played to a more appreciative audience. <laughs> An evening they'll long remember.
atop a new Yukon Trail, a few miles from the Alaskan border, men of the famous Canadian Mounted Police join in opening the new United States to Alaska Highway, one of the greatest road building feats of all time. Officials cut the ribbon barrier in simple tribute to the American Army engineers who blazed the vital pathway through the Arctic wilderness. Completed months ahead of schedule, the new 1,600-mile Alcon Highway sees the first truck convoy begin to roll, a new Northwest Passage linking the United States with Alaska. One year after entering the war, United States gains in naval tonnage shatter all records. Here, the Bellow Wood, laid down as a cruiser, goes down the ways. The third aircraft carrier launched within three months. At another shipyard, the carrier Bunker Hill is launched, one of 26 ships to slide down the ways in a single day. <laughs> Queen of them all, the giant new USS New Jersey, mightiest battleship ever built. Five stories high, she's the fastest afloat. Armament and guns, naval secrets. The New Jersey will soon be in action with the fleet. Mass of wreckage, tanks and guns, marks the wake of Field Marshal Rommel's flight across the desert. Nazi planes blasted on the ground and in the sky lie half buried beneath the hot and shifting African sands. In pursuit of the main force go tanks of Britain's victorious 8th Army spearhead of an advance that covered 100 miles in a single day. Over roads flooded by torrential rainfall, General Montgomery pushes on. Careful to protect his ever-lengthening supply line, he establishes bases along the way. Matru, once an important harbor, is littered with wrecked Axis supply ships, giant Nazi seaplanes that never got off the water. Nazis left to fight rear guard actions are captured. Italians drive their own trucks to prison camps behind the lines. Guards are hardly needed. The captives show no inclination to escape. Even high Nazi officers are taken in the route of Rommel. Human wreckage bearing witness to one of the greatest military collapses in history. Out in the vast cattle country of California, hard riding horsemen stage what Americans call a rodeo. Pitting his skill against untamed stallions and steers, each cowboy must hang on for 60 seconds to win the match. It's quite a trick, even for men born to the saddle. And when there's no saddle, well, that's what makes rodeo riding the most thrilling sport of the Western Plains. American industry solves the housing problem in war factory areas with ready-made or prefabricated homes. Windows are insulated, and with assembly line technique, the walls spring up like magic, 
all painted and ready for use. In truckloads of two or three houses, they're rushed wherever needed. One, two, and three bedroom homes can be set up in 80 minutes. There goes the roof, and here's the finished product. Kitchens are modern and equipped with the latest appliances. From bedroom to living room, it's a model home. Where war workers need housing, whole communities like this spring up overnight. British sailors in Virginia, while their ship is being refitted, spend shore leave helping nearby farmers harvest their crops. Back to the soil after months at sea is a real holiday. For English farm boys, raking hay and gathering corn seems just like home. They accept no pay, but the American farmers give them the time of their lives, all the beer and food they can hold. The world's largest auto bus, built to carry 117 passengers with speed and safety. Turning corners, it's so long the upper deck swings away from the lower. Used for transporting workers to war plants, the giant bus carries a load equal to 23 automobiles an important saving in gasoline and tires. Wings over England, but these are wings of the RAF, American-built bombers outward bound for daylight raids upon the continent. Raids to repay the Nazis tenfold for their wanton attacks upon defenseless cities. Crossing the channel, low flying makes it harder for enemy observers and sound detectors to spot them. Roaring in over the beaches, movie camera planted squarely in the nose of a bomber for a ringside seat in an actual raid upon Nazi-occupied France. complete mastery of the air makes possible these daring daylight forays. Interested only in military objectives, they wing on to a chemical plant making Nazi munitions, and the bombardiers lay their deadly eggs. Over channel ports now, blasting docks and installations with thousand pound bombs, and the camera records the damage. sailors swing down New York's Fifth Avenue as the nation celebrates Navy Day, a day in honor of America's famous fighting president, the late Theodore Roosevelt. Men of the Army pay tribute to the men in blue as all America salutes the fleet that's now in action on the seven seas. Red Cross nurses, Units of the British Navy, passing in review. Today, the nation's battle cry is, the Navy, first line of attack. Women in the war. U.S. Navy nurses line up for inspection in their new summer uniforms. Every day, new legions are being called to active duty afloat and ashore. Ready to follow the fleet to any battlefront, these traditional angels of mercy know but one code, service to humanity. Women, as always, the heroes of all wars. 
In Washington, the commander of the newly formed Women's Army Auxiliary Corps begins her duties. A housewife and mother, she will direct an army of 250,000 women. Women who will work behind the lines, relieving more men for combat duty in the field. The first call for volunteers brings thousands to recruiting stations. Upon passing rigid examinations, they will undergo intensive training, live like regular soldiers under strict army regulations. American women signing up to fight shoulder to shoulder with their men. The commander at the Capitol. For the first time in history, the army now has an authorized army of women. In mountain country, a woman's motorcycle corps takes to the field. Trained as dispatch riders, they carry messages and first aid equipment to lonely outposts. Women of America serving on the home front. The U.S. Post Office inaugurates a fast new mail service for soldiers and sailors overseas. Letters written on special forms, four by five inches when folded, are stamped and posted like regular mail. Each letter, passed by the sensor, is photographed on small rolls of 16 millimeter microfilm. A 100 foot roll of film can carry 1,500 individual letters. Quite a saving in cargo space when you realize that 150,000 letters that ordinarily fill 22 sacks will on microfilm take just one bag. On arrival, the letters are enlarged to readable size. Good news for servicemen overseas. Somewhere in the Pacific, an unnamed United States aircraft carrier prepares for action. Contact with the enemy is established and fighter planes take off to attack. Guns are made ready. A Jap plane is met with a hail of anti-aircraft fire. Suddenly, an explosion on the afterdeck. A Jap bomber has scored a hit. Gunners keep right on blazing away. Firefighters and relief crews spring into action. But wait, looking aloft, they sight another dive bomber screaming in for the kill. As the deck crew seeks cover, the Navy cameraman filming these pictures sticks to his post. Gaping bomb hole reveals the damage, but it hasn't silenced the gunners. They're still firing away, and now they've scored a hit. There, blazing in the sea, are two Jap bombers blasted to bits. Now the carrier is fighting two foes, fire at sea and enemy planes. Calmly, the crew works to keep the flames from spreading, and they do a seamanlike job. Her port gun smashed with that first hit on the flight deck. The carrier flashes word to her escort, we're still full of fight. The flight deck repaired, all planes accounted for. Action in the Pacific with the United States carrier. Once a year, Hollywood honors its brightest stars. Tonight, they also salute the 27,000 men of the cinema industry now serving in the armed forces. Now, Gary Cooper, voted the best actor for 1941, awards the prize for 1942. The winner, Jimmy Cagney for his Yankee Doodle Dandy. The lovely Joan Fontaine, Irish-born Greer Garson, wins the award for her unforgettable Mrs. Miniver, the new king and queen of movie land. Typical of the speed with which great American industrial plants have been converted to war is this arms factory somewhere in Midwestern United States. 
A year ago, these girls made automobile tires. Today, they inspect some of the 1,500 precision parts that go into the making of Bofors and the aircraft guns. From sub-assembly lines, workmen once skilled in production for peace are now breaking records manufacturing weapons for war. U.S. improvements in construction have reduced costs 25%. Welded parts have taken the place of rivets. The time to produce each unit has been cut by nearly a third. Flexible to handle, the 40 millimeter mobile Bofors can fire from any angle, from vertical to horizontal. Its barrel moves fast enough to follow a plane diving 500 miles an hour. Leaving the factory for shipment to United Nations battlefronts halfway around the world, the completed gun, credited with being the most effective weapon in the defense of London during the 1940 Battle of Britain, is now rolling from U.S. assembly lines at the rate of thousands every month. In the field, they're ready for action in less than a minute. of the horrors of war finds China unconquered. Five years of murder and pillage by a ruthless nation bent on enslaving or exterminating a helpless people. Five million innocent civilian victims have perished. And yet, China fights on, its spirit undaunted. From battered Chongqing, blasted and rebuilt a dozen times, the Chinese Republic carries on the fight. Here, Madame Chiang Kai-shek, American-educated wife of China's leader, ministers to her people, inspiring them to even greater effort with her own unfailing courage. Mobilizing the young womanhood of the nation in unprecedented numbers, Madame Chiang symbolizes the spirit of the new China. Today, bombed-out war industries take to the fields, and rallying behind Chiang Kai-shek, an army of 26 million men. Here is China's answer to the invader. Fifteen United Nations heroes arrive in New York to help launch a nationwide drive for the sale of war bonds. Up Broadway, men of England's RAF, men of America's Navy, Men who have met their enemies and defeated them respond to the cheers of New York's millions. Eager for a glimpse of the men they've read about, enthusiastic thousands gather in City Hall Plaza. The triumphal procession roars its way uptown. In its most uproarious reception of the war, New York pays tribute to fighting men of the United Nations. This is your American Expeditionary Station in the field with the Fifth Army, a radio service for American fighting men and their allies. I'm in the mood for love, simply because you're near me. But when you're near me, I'm in the mood for love. Why stop to think of weather? This little dream might fail. We put our hearts together. If it should rain, we'll let it. But for tonight, 
hunk of home. We wish we could wrap it all up and send it to you. The Sierras, for example, where the snow touches the sky, the shoreline where the mountains meet the sea, the redwood trees, the tallest in the whole world, or a sight of San Francisco Bay, the city rising behind it like, like silver towers. We'd like to send you Hollywood the excitement of a busy soundstage. Yes, and the forests of oil wells. The dairy farms of Alameda. The lumber towns and the orange groves. The vineyards heavy with grapes as far as your eye can see. The airplane factories, almost in the shadow of old mission. This is California. This cross-section of almost everything. This full helping of the good life. This is America. Mail Call is one of the 106 transcribed programs shipped overseas each week by the Armed Forces Radio Service at the request of the commanding generals of the theaters of operation. Armed Forces Radio Service also supplies complete radio stations, receivers, and trains operating crews of officers and enlisted men at headquarters Armed Forces Radio Service, Los Angeles, California. Another mail call will be coming your way the next time you hear... Lucky Strike Green has gone to war. Yes, Lucky Strike Green has gone to war. We're off to drive the heights right off of the high knee. We're off to slap the jap right off of the neck. We'll knock him on his axis right from here to Alabama. Oh, the son of a gun who picks on Uncle Sam. We're off to drive the heights right off of the We don't care if it's Tripoli or Sumatra. We don't care if it's Tokyo or Siam. Who we'll fucks the suki out of any diagram? Oh, the son of a gun who picks on Uncle Sam. Well, the Danes and Dutch and French and such, they are not forgotten men. Tell the cockeyed world our flags unfurled. The planes are humming, the tanks are coming, the Yanks are in again. We've got a wood cabona for the Mikado. We've got the mausoleum for Mussolini. We'll pickle, shickle, groover for the coroners and jam. Oh, we're out to Harbor Monogram on the side of a gun. These have been some of the highlights of the year 1942. We've seen how the focus of life in America is the war. Hollywood stars selling war bonds and entertaining the troops with films and radio broadcasts. Even a racing classic is turned to the war effort. For 1942 has been a desperate year of war in spite of the impressive victory at Midway. 1943 will see the fighting continue as hope begins to blossom that our crusade to free the world from tyranny will be successful. Our boys are still fighting. Are you still saving used fat? It's urgently needed to help make Battlefront and Homefront supplies. Presenting in person and in the spotlight, Sammy Kay. <laughs> This is Sammy Kay. The men of Hollaburg Ordnance Motor Base asked the Victory Parade of Spotlight Band to send us out here. And we're going to use a song from our motion picture Iceland to tell you why we came.
tonight for all the girls from lovely Nancy Norman. You can't say no to a soldier, a sailor, or a handsome Marine. No, you can't say no if he wants to dance. If he's gonna fight, he's got a right to romance. So get out your lipstick and powder. Beautiful and beautiful too. If he's not your type, then it's still okay. You can always kiss him in a sisterly way. 